Paul actually became CEO of Unilever in 2009. And under his leadership, Unilever has set out an ambitious vision to decouple its growth from overall environmental footprint and increase its positive social impact. Paul actively seeks cooperation with other companies to implement sustainable business strategies and drive systemic change. He is chairman, as some of you know, of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, a member of the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum, the B team, and sits on the board of the UN Global Compact. He is closely involved in global discussions of the sustainable development goals, which we've been talking about today, and the action to tackle climate change. In 2016, Paul was asked by the UN Secretary General to become a member of the SDG Advocacy Group, tasked with promoting action on the 2030 Agenda. Prior to this, he served on the high-level panel on post-2015 Development Agenda, presenting recommendations on behalf of the private sector. He's a member of the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, he also served on the International Council of the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate under the former Mexican President, Philippe Calderon. In recognition of his contribution to responsible business, Paul has received numerous awards, including the UN Foundation's Champion for Global Change in 2014, the Oslo Business for Peace Award in 2015, and the UN Environment Programs Champion of Earth Award in 2015. And I could go on, but if there's one word that sums up this man that I've come to know over the last eight years, it is authentic. Paul is an authentic leader, probably the most authentic leader I know. And he means what he says, and he lives by what he says but he also means business. And any brand or any person in Unilever that do not sign on to his sustainable living plan must either shape up or get off the bus. Now that's easy when you are managing something like Lifebuoy Soap. It's not so easy when you're managing Hellman's mayonnaise or Wall's ice cream. But every person and every brand is now aligned behind that sustainable plan. So it's a privilege for me to introduce Paul as he delivers this forum's keynote address, putting sustainability at the heart of the business, because that's what he's done in Unilever. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Polwa. Thanks, Nihal. You're way too kind. Um, I'm always happy that my mother isn't in the audience, I tell you. <laughs> the, uh, in fact, the, the three things I'm most proud of uh, being here in Singapore is obviously having Nihal as a friend. And you can see how he exaggerates, which is what good friends do for you. And um, my daughter-in-law, who is Singaporean, and uh, actually proud of getting not long ago here, the surface star from the city of Singapore. So I feel a little bit Singaporean as well in, uh, in being here. I don't know how many are here from Singapore in the first place. Raise your hands for a second. Yeah, so that's a good proportion of people. But anyway, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk to you uh, briefly and um, share with you some of the thoughts. But before I do that, I want to thank uh, my good friend Sonny here as well, because if we talk about an authentic leader or a level five leader, as uh, Jim Collins calls it. It's uh, Sonny, what he is uh, doing, uh, first and foremost, by pulling you all together here and trying to create something bigger than each of us individually can do, which is absolutely crucial in today's world. And uh, giving his energy 
to the broader cause, which I call the common good, is to me a true leadership. We're at a point that we have to put our own agendas apart, even though we have the pressures of our P&Ls and, and the shareholders and the quarterly results. Uh, we are at a point that uh, to really ensure the viability of our companies long term and the viability of this planet or the human race, if you want to, we really have to work differently. We have to work differently as individual companies. We have to work differently together. We have to assume different responsibilities towards each other. And I can't think of a better person than Sonny who does this with his work with the World Business Council, the UN, the UN Global Compact. And frankly, um, there were many people involved in the COP21 agreements in Paris uh, not long ago. But again, uh, you can be very proud of the role that uh, Olam played in that to build this sustainable future for all of us. And obviously it should not come as a surprise to you that I really want to talk a little bit about that sustainable future. Olam, in its uh, endeavors and its history, and I have to congratulate Olam because I believe it's 25 years now, more or less at the same time, so it's a very important milestone. But, you know, you're focused on building these thriving communities. You're focused on a commitment to providing the water or hygiene or sanitation that you've talked about. You've talked about today getting, uh, putting the smallholder farmer in the middle of all the things we're doing. Uh, just simply looking at the economics of 7 billion people in this world going to 10 billion people. Of the fourth industrial revolution coming with robotics, artificial intelligence, internet of things, virtual reality, which probably brings in a lot of good things, but also challenges a lot of job opportunities for people. Think about driverless cars or check out uh, people as checkout counters in supermarkets, factories that run on robots. Some people think a 1.8 billion job destruction at a time that we have 3.5 billion people living in marginal jobs in this world. The fourth industrial revolution coming and 2 billion people more in uh, entering this wonderful world. It's obviously crucial that we think about including everybody and being a smallholder farmer right now, you're not getting a very good deal. And yet we need to create actually more jobs in farming, not only to feed this world, and there might be other ways to feed this world if we wanted to, but also to provide the right to participate in this world. And that's why the key of what you are doing here goes way beyond your own companies, goes way beyond actually what you talked here with the companies that are present, numerous as they may be. But it boils down to the essence of, are we going to change the way we're doing things to, to end up having a more inclusive society? Or are we going to derail the ship that we're on or the train that we're driving? And it's our choice. And we are in a fortunate position to do something about it. The reality is 98% of the world's population cannot. They're the smallholder farmers that you talked about. By the way, 85% living in poverty, 90% malnutritioned. The stunted children that we have, you'll find them amongst their children. The kids that don't make it past the age of five, you find them amongst their children. The ones that don't enter the workforce have a right to education, you find it amongst their children. The issue that we talk about here is obviously the broader issue of the sustainable development goals. Now, we've had a great run in the last 50 years. There's no doubt about it. The last 50 years, if you look at our global economy, per capita income in the last 50 years alone has more than tripled in this world. The GDP has actually grown sixfold. We can be proud of that if those are the only measures. But the reality is we've lifted many, many people out of poverty. We were talking today at the social impact uh, conference that uh, Nihil had or uh, Nihal had organized with uh, NUS and and the uh, development bank here, and some wonderful entrepreneurs, and I told them the same thing. This is the best time to be born. Don't feel bad about anything. My message is not really that. People live longer than ever before. People, more people are in education than ever before. Believe it or not, but more women are participating in the economies than ever before. It doesn't mean that there aren't many opportunities, but we have done an enormous job. In fact, the original Millennial Development Goals, which started in the year 2000 under Kofi Annan, had a simple goal of halving the number of people living in poverty. At that time, most people said it's impossible. We cannot achieve that. It was defined as $1.25 a day. Lo and behold, we're 15 years further and we've actually achieved that. Then people say, ah, but this was basically China. No, we've achieved that in many places in the world. We can be proud of what we have done.
But it's also clear that increasingly we're coming to the realization that the way we have been doing these things is simply not sustainable. Obviously, it was human inventiveness. It was political leadership. It was social and technology advancement. It was globalization of the world that helped lift these people out of poverty. But we forgot one thing, which frankly wasn't on the agenda because it wasn't urgent. We forgot to ask ourselves, is the way we're doing this sustainable? In business, you'd ask the same question. But unfortunately, with the complexities of the world and the issues we dealt with in 2000 or before, when we didn't have this enormous wealth creation, this, co this linear consumption pattern, we didn't think about the effects that we were creating. And frankly, it was only in the crisis of 2007, 2008, in my opinion, when things started to derail. I always say when the stock market goes up 7, 8, 9% a year, every year, nobody's asking questions. But when it started to derail, people woke up. First, they said it's a financial crisis, Lehman Brothers. Then they said it spilled over to an economic crisis. And then they said it's a political crisis. Look at how the governments are dealing with each other now, the number of geopolitical conflicts that we have. At the end of the day, it was none of those. It was none of those. It was a crisis of morality. In fact, we came to the belief to, to see that the system that we had created of wealth creation frankly wasn't sustainable. I think more people started to realize that high levels of government and private debt, overconsumption, frankly, in one part of the world, and system that leaves too many people behind ultimately will not function, ultimately will rebel against itself. Any system where too many people feel they're not participating or not getting a fair uh, chances stacked up fairly for them, versus others will ultimately not function. So the past drivers of our economic growth are not going to be the future drivers of economic growth. Just the example of the enormous pressures that we have now on our planetary boundaries. Frankly, it wasn't the, the original millennial development goals weren't even global. They were like the issues are in the developing market. And basically, it's AIDS, IV, AIDS, or some other things that were prevalent at that time. Climate change was not even on the agenda for anybody. But we're at the point again that climate change actually now has risks pushing many people back into poverty. In fact, 100 million people, according to the World Bank, if we go above the trajectory of 2 degrees Celsius. It was um, Hubert Reeves, a uh, philosopher from Canada, who said something that always stuck to me. He said, man is the most insane species. He worships an invisible God and destroys a visible nature, not realizing that the visible nature he destroys is the invisible God he worships in the first place. And that is more or less the trajectory that we're on, if we like it or not. So what do we need to do to snap out of that? In fact, an enormous opportunity, an enormous opportunity. When you live in a world where 800 million people go to bed hungry, not even knowing if they wake up the next day, where two and a half billion people don't have access to clean water or hygiene or sanitation, as you want to call it, where climate change is one of the most burning issues affecting the poor, unfortunately, much more than the rich, if we like it or not, then obviously we live in a world not only with enormous challenges, as you might want to see that, but I would like to see this as a world with enormous opportunities. Any of these things turning it around are probably the biggest opportunities that we have. Here we have the world's governments just meeting with the G20, not far from here, only a week or two ago. The governments in Europe trying to figure out how to grow our global economy, how to create jobs, how to make it more inclusive. And we have the answer given to us on a silver platter under our nose. The Sustainable Development Goals, which were, by the way, signed by 193 countries in the world. No agreement has got that many signatures, actually, by the UN, if you want to. The Law of the Seas was one about 30 years ago that got about a little more than half of those, having 193 countries signed. And then, by the way, having the 193 countries follow up with that right away in September, six months later, in December, sorry, 
after they signed the Sustainable Development Goals in September. Follow up was that was the climate change agreements, where they basically said, we're going to decarbonize the economy. We're not only going to eradicate poverty, which is what the Sustainable Development Goals do, but we're also going to eradicate, uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, deal with the issue of uh, climate change and decarbonizing our global economy. An enormous strong signal has been sent to everybody in this world. And when people send a consistent and strong signal, you'll get action, especially from the business community, who wouldn't like anything clearer and, and then, then clarity of the direction we're going. The moment Paris came out with the climate change commitments, you saw businesses accelerating their internal adoption on the price of carbon, a thousand companies now. You saw the divestiture movement of funds under management divesting from carbon move from 900 billion to 2.6 uh, trillion. You saw the market of green bonds going up. All of a sudden, $34 trillion of money under management was asking for a price on carbon. The Financial Standard Board op opened their disclosure committee, the Michael Bloomberg Committee on Financial Disclosure on Climate Change to the financial markets. 57 coal companies went bankrupt. Things start to accelerate when there's certainty. So what we now need to do very simply with the Sustainable Development Goals is to create that same path of certainty. And it's a little bit more difficult because there are 17 goals, 169 targets. Anybody in business would say, if I have to do so many things, how can I keep it straight? We wouldn't make a strategy plan like that. But the reality is we're dealing here with the complexities of the world. And different countries can pick different targets, like different companies can pick different targets and pick the ones that they think are most relevant to them. Now, the overseas, the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals is estimated to cost about two to three trillion dollars a year. Sounds like a lot, but if you realize that the global economy is about a hundred trillion dollars, then two to three trillion dollars is about two to three percent of the total. It is really relatively small. And the payouts are actually enormous of any of those investments. Investing in women in this world, just giving women the same rights as men, access to financing, education, land rights, alone, according to McKinsey, would increase the global economy by $28 trillion. Nutrition, attacking the issues of stunting in Sub-Sahara Africa or many parts of India or Asia right now, Stunting basically not getting enough nutrition in the first thousand days, 160 million children. That alone for many of these economies is 10 to 15% of their total GDP. Water, sanitation and hygiene has a potential to unlock global economies between 15 and 20 trillion. We're sitting here on probably on one of the biggest wealth creators or opportunities to grow our global economy and doing it in a more responsible way than anything else. The environmental parts of the Sustainable Development Goals, which are basically goals 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and obviously including goal number seven, you would probably have goal number two in there on food security sitting here today. But if you take those goals alone, they're estimated to bring another 14 to 26 trillion to the global economy if we implement them. If you look at the social goals, which are the most important ones. They're the early goals in the, in the Sustainable Development 17 goals. Mm -hmm. Two, three, four, five, and six. Education, gender equality, women, all these goals. That alone has a potential between 20 and 40 trillion dollars. And then the economic goals, which we like as businesses. They're important to us because I think most businesses now understand that there is no business case in enduring poverty. If these economies don't function, if you get more refugees in Europe, if you get the issues to deal with of climate change, the cost you're going to pay is much higher. We understand the economic benefits. The economic benefits are probably anywhere between 15 and 30 trillion dollars. And these are hard facts in the aids of transparency that we can measure it. We're at a point, as I often point out, that the cost of not acting is higher than the cost of acting for all of us. And still some businesses don't see this or don't want to see this because it's true for all of us. 
The companies that don't internalize their true purpose for being will soon be folded out of office by the citizens of this world for not having a purpose. Why should we, as citizens of this world, in which capacity I stand here, support with my hard-earned money companies that have no purpose, that claim to be less bad instead of making things good? Companies that don't help, even for me, address proactively the issues that we have out there have, in my opinion, no reason for being. And frankly, the consumers are already, or citizens if you want to call them, are already doing this. They're voting with their wallets. And by the way, increasingly so. Because the next generation coming up is the millennial generation. Much more purpose driven. And we're about to see the biggest transfer of intergenerational wealth to that generation. And they're already disengaging from many of the companies. If you're in the food industry, like we happen to be and many others in this audience, you ought to be worried. About 85% of the growth of the food industry in the US now is for ethical, what they would call ethical brands. Neighborhood, bio, organic. It confuses everybody. Look at the share prices of companies that are still in what you might call the old economy. Consumers are voting already. They're also voting in different ways. The average length now of a publicly traded company in the US is 17 years. The average length of a CEO in office is only four and a half years. Unfortunately, it's my ninth year and the only one that is disappointed in not sticking to the statistics of the world is my wife, so I always have to speak up for her. But people are not able to deal with this environment and citizens don't want them to deal or do things that don't make sense anymore. And in this age of transparency, it's very quick to see if it doesn't make sense. If you think it's cool to buy a $1 t-shirt, you discover it comes from the Rana Plaza factory, where 1130 women, innocent women, lose their lives by only getting paid 11 cents an hour. You start to realize it's all of a sudden not cool to buy a $1 t-shirt. When you see how animals are being treated in a value chain, you probably become, for most of them, vegetarians yesterday. When you see how people are being traded, one of the biggest challenges now is slave labor coming in again, for the simple reason that we have more displaced and refugees in the world than ever before. If they're in your value chain, it's not so cool to buy from you anymore. The standards that are being put on us have changed dramatically. Companies that understand that and use it as opportunities have enormous possibilities. Companies that don't will be folded out of office. And frankly, we're at an equal point where the cost of not acting is going to exceed the cost of acting. Many people are estimating that if we continue to play with these planetary boundaries and our biodiversity, that the cost to our economies are going to be 15 to 20 trillion dollars higher in the next 20, 30 years. Already today, this world spends 9.7 trillion dollars every year, 9.7 trillion dollars every year, on dealing with wars and the effects of wars. Good for the arms industry, you might say. The implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals only cost us two to three billion dollars. Sounds to me like a good payout because I can tell you that if we implement the Sustainable Development Goals, we have to spend significantly less on wars and dealing with the effects of wars. I hope you agree with me. Now, for companies, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to come to what you are doing today and why the agriculture industry, if I may call you all here today, is probably the most important part for the Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm not saying that because you sit here and go tomorrow to the banking industry and tell them the same thing. I'm saying that because everything that relates to human development probably touches the value chain of agriculture. And frankly, we together, our predecessors, we together have created the most bizarre thing out there that you can imagine. 800 million people going to bed, wasting 30 to 40% of the food, cutting down the forests of this world, starving the lungs of this world, creating the biggest epi epidemic that the world has ever seen on the other side, 
with di diabetes too, obesity and overweight, producing all the stuff in an incredibly unsustainable way. And then the people that do it for us, we stamp on them. We stamp on them because for some reason what they do is not valued. I would say anybody that comes in from Mars, from Pluto or from Jupiter, will tell you that we have absolutely lost it. And then we walk around and call ourselves the most intelligent species. I have a hard time understanding that. I have a hard time understanding that. If we rise to the challenge, we can fix it. And the beauty of it is, especially when it gets to the food supply, you don't need more PhDs. You don't need to send missions to Mars. You don't need to invent new technologies. What you need is human willpower. You need adults to work together, to think that to understand that working for the interest of the common good is now also the most important thing to protect their own interest. To understand that if you don't join and, and jump on this train, you're going to be left behind very soon. The jobs to do are easy. They're hard work, but they're easy to see. I don't have to explain that to anybody. First, get your own house in order. What do you do in your own company? Are you moving to green energy? Are you treating your people well? You provide their, the, the way you source or produce. Are you having waste in your systems? Deserve a seat at the table by bringing your, house, your own house in order. Not to talk about Unilever because it's absolutely not important to me. But when I said we won't have zero waste in factories, because there's something about waste that we mislabeled. Waste we should call unethical. There is nothing ethical about waste. What do we have as right to waste things? This planet Earth has been around for three billion years or more and done pretty well. Prosperous, enormous resources. Never wasted one thing of anything. It invented the circular economy for all of us. We come along 200 years of industrial revolution and bang. We hit the boundaries of our planetary existence, not caring for any of their future generations. Waste is unethical. Waste is also an enormous opportunity to drive cost out of your system if you don't believe in ethics. So I think we should all be at the same place, irrespective of where you are. Then you work your value chain, just like you've done today. You've made an incredible step forward. 38 countries, companies, sorry, 38 companies have signed up and said, we want to work the value chain. We see it's important that we put all the players around the table to solve some things that are bigger than we can do alone. You're courageous to do that, because otherwise you would not get to the real step changes or the transformations that we're needing. And then after you do your value chain, you move to the next step. And I think Sonny is giving the example there, which is really drive for real transformative changes well beyond your own company. Helping governments get the courage to change systems. Changing whole industries the way things are being done. The opportunities once more, just to looking at food. The food waste that we have in our system is about 700 to 800 billion dollars every year, the 30 to 40 percent. By the way, for climate change, it's the third biggest emitter after China and India just cutting the food by about one-third would give 200 million people the chance to sleep at night. That alone should be worth it. The cost that we take out of the system is enormous. And it can be done. Most of the projects that we have individually show that. If we work together, we can scale it. And the world needs that scaling right now. Andrew, who is here from the World Resource Institute, Andrew Steer, started the initiative, 12.3. It's named after the Sustainable Development Goal, sub-goal 12.3, which deals with food waste, bringing industries together and seeing if we can break the current trajectory, if you want to, and, and tap into that waste. And it's absolutely possible. The meetings we've had, looking at the companies, the people we bring together, they all say, yeah, alone I can't do it because I can't put the infrastructure in. I might not have the funds to build the storage systems. I might not guarantee the total crop from the farmer mm -hmm. or bring in new techniques so that he has less waste and the crop doesn't lay on the land. 
but we can do it together. And as we do it together, we can tap into these opportunities. And many opportunities there are. We as businesses can bring better technologies. We can build climate resistant agricultural systems. We can provide access to seeds and other things, infrastructure investments. We can provide capital that often has a high return on yield for people that cannot get access to the capital. We can restore degraded land with all the benefits. Food, the food chain, has more possibilities than any other chain we see in the world. Now, to get over this complexity of the Sustainable Development Goals and be able to distill this down into simplicity and action, we've created the, the Commission for Business and Sustainable Development. Jeremy is here, and the goal of that commission is very simple. It is to get the sustainable development goals more higher on the agenda of companies and then actually provide suggestions of how you implement it. The work of that committee is going to be absolutely crucial. Just like we did on climate change with the new Climate Economy Commission, we also think that the work we're doing here with the Business and Sustainable Development Commission will really accelerate, accelerate our opportunities to attack the issues that we're talking about. But the most important thing that um, we need for that is probably here in the room. It is your leadership. I've come to the conclusion, perhaps a little bit late in my life, I wish I would have come to that conclusion earlier, but I came to the conclusion a long time ago that I was very fortunate, very fortunate to be born in the Netherlands. Could have been born anywhere else. Wasn't my choice. My parents, you could accuse of it. But it certainly wasn't my choice. I've been very fortunate to be able to go to school. My country provided that. I made it past the age of five. I had an opportunity to find a job and progress the career and be able to talk to you now. Unfortunately, that still isn't true for 98% of the world population. If you belong to the fortunate 2%, it's your obligation, your obligation to put yourself to the service of the other 98%. And the more you do that, the more successful you will be. Absolutely no doubt about that. The more successful you will be. So here you are together. 38 companies have signed up to create something bigger and better than each of us individually can do. And not for ourselves. I know you'll have the arguments, I'm busy. I'm already involved in many other initiatives. It won't lead to anything anyway, because someone else will derail it. I'm not so sure my boss is behind it. We have enough of those people. This brought us only so far. That's why we're standing here. Here you have a hero heroic leader. Sonny himself, who puts the interest of others ahead. He's not here to help you make Olam a better company. He's not here to crank up his quarterly profits right now or ask you to buy a little bit more from him. He's here to simply ask you something. Do you want to be part of a movement that creates a better world for everybody? Do you want to be part of a group of people that can say in the 15 years that we are in the prime of our possibilities to influence this? We've irreversibly eradicated poverty in a more sustainable and equitable way. And that requires courage. That requires courage. And that requires a little bit of trust and confidence. I've signed up for some things sometimes. I didn't know, frankly, either what I was signing up for. But at the end of the end, some worked and some didn't work. But I can tell you one thing. If you have 38 companies already signed up, and hopefully tonight you'll get 50 at least in total to sign up. You are a movement of critical mass beyond any other movement that exists in agriculture. Sure, there are initiatives. Sure, there are people working pieces of it. But you are such a crucial part of that value chain. We certainly, as food companies, and I know there are others in the room, are going to 100% support this. Because we know that what you do with your 50 in the value chain together needs our support to be successful as well. Your success is my success. And our success is the success for the 98% of the people that can be here tonight. 
So my simple question to you is, put your own interests to the side and put your services to the benefit of the ones that didn't make it past the age of five, didn't go to school, or go to bed hungry. A moment to rise to the challenge, a moment to be proud of, and a moment to say to the world, we made a difference. You're that close, you certainly set the stake today in the ground, and I wish you all the success, and you certainly have all my support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul.